Family Worship, Day 3 Call to Worship Hear God call you to worship through His Word. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. Psalm 75, 1 Adoration We bless you for your preservation of us during the past night, and we desire to acknowledge again our dependence upon you and our unfeigned obligations toward you. We thank you for having poured down upon us so many blessings of this life. We thank you for our health and strength, for our food and dress, and for all the comforts and conveniences which we enjoy. But above all, we praise you for the inestimable privilege of being born in a land of religious light and knowledge. For these, and for all your various and great mercies, we would render unto you a grateful heart, and we would endeavor to show our gratitude, not with our lips only, but with our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days on earth. Amen. Henry Thornton Reading of the Law Hear God's law as his will for your life. Our Lord Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3-10 Confession of Sin O Lord, you have mercy upon all. Take away from me my sins, and mercifully kindle in me the fire of your Holy Spirit. Take away from me the heart of stone, and give me a heart of flesh, a heart to love and adore you, a heart to delight in you, to follow and to enjoy you, for Christ's sake. Amen. Ambrose Assurance of Pardon Receive these words of comfort from God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have a eternal life. John 3.16 Confession of our faith comes in the Athanasian Creed, Part 1. Whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to the Catholic faith. Anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken will doubtless perish eternally. Now this is the Catholic faith that we worship one God in Trinity, and the Trinity in unity, neither confounding their persons nor dividing the essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person, the person of the Son is another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son is uncreated, the Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable, the Son is immeasurable, the Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The Father is eternal, the Son is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet there are not three eternal beings, there is but one eternal being. So, too, there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings. There is but one uncreated and immeasurable being. Similarly, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet there are not three almighty beings. There is but one almighty being. Thus, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet there are not three gods. There is but one God. 
Thus the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet there are not three lords, there is but one Lord. Just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, so Catholic religion forbids us to say that there are three gods or lords. Praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now for the Catechism. From the Baptist Catechism, questions 21 to 30. Keech's Catechism, questions 21 through 30. Question 21. Into what estate did the fall bring mankind? Answer. The fall brought mankind into an estate of sin and misery. Question 22. Wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein to men fell? Answer. The sinfulness of that estate wherein to men fell consists in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of original righteousness, and the corruption of his whole nature which is commonly called original sin, together with all actual transgressions which proceed from it. Question 23. What is the misery of that estate whereunto man fell? Answer. All mankind by their fall lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, and made liable to all the miseries of this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Question 24. Did God leave all mankind to perish in the estate of sin and misery? Answer. God, out of his mere good pleasure, from all eternity, having chosen a people to everlasting life, did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the estate of sin and misery, and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a Redeemer. Question 25. Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? Answer. The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being the eternal Son of God, became man, and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever. Question 26. How did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? Answer. Christ, the Son of God, became man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and born of her, yet without sin. Question 27. What offices does Christ execute as our Redeemer? Answer. Christ, as our Redeemer, executes the offices of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. Question 28. How does Christ execute the office of a prophet? Answer. Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to us, by this word and spirit, the will of God for our salvation. Question 29. How does Christ execute the office of a priest? Answer. Christ executes the office of a priest in his once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God, and in making continual intercession for us. Question 30. How does Christ execute the office of a king? Answer. Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. <laughs> Prayer for Illumination O oh, make your word a swift word, passing from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip and conversation, that, as the rains returns not empty, so neither may your word, but accomplish that for which it is given. Amen. George Herbert Prayer of Intercession 
Let your mighty hand and outstretched arm, O Lord, still be our defense. Your mercy and loving kindness in Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our salvation, your true and holy word, our instruction, your grace and Holy Spirit, our comfort and consolation, unto the end and in the end. Amen. John Bradford. In closing, we'll pray, the, we'll pray the Lord's Prayer, the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.